The Case of the Vanishing Honeybees, a scientific mystery written by Sandra Marco. It's a mystery. On a warm day in October 2006, Dave Hackenberg went to check on his workers. Hackenberg is a beekeeper, and his workers are millions of honeybees. As he walked among a group of nearly 400 beehives, he expected to see the air full of bees. It wasn't. Curious, Hackenberg lifted the cover of one hive and peeked inside. Three weeks earlier, when he drove this group of beehive to Florida from Pennsylvania, each hive was home to about 30,000 bees. Now he found only the bee colony's egg-laying queen and her brood developing young inside the hive. Thousands of worker bees were missing. Worried, Hackenberg checked dozens more hives. He discovered they were nearly empty too, but there weren't any dead bees to be found inside the hives or on the ground around the hives. In his 50 years as a beekeeper, Hackenberg had never seen anything quite like this. What had happened to all the bees? This is a section of a beehive after the workers disappeared and the untended brood died. If honeybees are in trouble, we're in trouble. Having insects such as honeybees vanish may not seem like a big deal, but it is. Without honeybees, you could be limited to eating oats, rice, and corn. These foods come from plants that use wind to move their pollen, male reproductive cell, to their ovules, female reproductive cells. The process of transferring pollen is called pollination. It has to happen for a plant to produce seeds, parts that contain an embryo or baby plant. That's how the plants produce more of its own kind of plant. The wind pollinates some plants, but birds, bats, and insects, especially bees, pollinate many more. Honeybees, in particular, are needed in order to grow apples, raspberries, watermelons, almonds, and cucumbers, to name just a few. These are some of the foods you can enjoy thanks to honeybees. Honeybees depend on plants just as plants depend on bees. Many plants produce nectar, a sweet liquid to attract bees and other pollinators. Bees gather this liquid as food. The nectar's scent attract bees to a plant. Many flowers are also colored to signal that they contain nectar. The flowers are shaped to make sure that visiting honeybees will spread pollen and return for the food. To reach nectar, a worker bee usually has to burrow into a flower. The bee brushes past the flower's male parts, where it collects pollen, and the female parts contain the plant's ovules. The bee pick up pollen this way and also drops off a little pollen, often from another flower. To form a seed, the ovules and the pollen must be from the same kind of plant. Fortunately, honeybees tend to visit only one kind of plant during a nectar-collecting flight, and each flower produces just a few drops of nectar a day. So during each flight, a bee visits as many as 400 flowers, that's a lot of pollination. Back at the hive, the worker passes the nectar it collected to another bee. That bee uses its straw-like mouth part to pump the nectar into a cell in the hive's wax comb, or wall of wax cells. The nectar mixes with the bee's digestive juices, then lots of worker bees join in fanning their wings. This increases airflow over the nectar mixture in the cells. Nectar straight from the flower is as much as 80% water. Airflow causes some of the water to evaporate or move into the air, but doing this just once isn't enough. Another bee sucks up the liquid and repeats the process. Little by little, the nectar becomes sugar-rich, thick liquid honey. Bees eat honey for energy to fly and stay active. Any extra is stored in the hive cell and capped with wax. The bees will eat this honey later, when plants aren't flowering and producing nectar. Between flights, this worker bee passes its nectar load mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to another worker. Bees get more food from a plant than just the nectar. They use the plant's pollen too. While bees are sucking up nectar, pollen sticks to them. They regularly comb pollen off their bodies and pack it into a basket-like part on their hind legs. Some pollen brushes off on other flowers. There's always some leftover though, when the bees return to the hive. Each returning bee backs into one of the empty wax cells on the comb and flicks off the pollen. Other workers chew the pollen, mixing it with a little honey. That turns the pollen into bee bread, a high protein food bees need to stay strong and healthy. As you can see, the partnership between bees and plants is important to life for both. Without plants producing nectar and pollen, bees wouldn't have food. And without bees visiting the flower to collect nectar, many plants wouldn't be able to reproduce. This partnership benefits another group too, people. 
A bee's hind legs have a cup-like shape surrounded by stiff curve hairs. These act like little baskets for carrying pollen grains. In January 2007, beekeepers in the United States met. Many had experienced losses like David Heckenberg's. They named the mysterious loss of their bees Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD. By then, it was clear this wasn't a local problem or even just limited to the United States. There were reports of bee colonies collapsing in many countries around the world. Beekeepers everywhere were losing about 30% of their hives. In some places, the reported losses were as high as 50%. Beekeepers learn to look for signs such as shrinking number of worker bees that could mean their bee colonies are in danger of collapse. This was a bigger issue than beekeepers losing business. Without honeybees, some food crops would fail. People could go hungry. Like beekeepers, scientists joined forces to tackle CCD. Everyone agreed the worker bees must be dying, not just leaving their hives. Only death could keep honeybee workers from returning to the colony. So what could be killing the bees? There were a few dead bees to provide clues about what happened. All in the family. The beekeeper marks the queen bee to make her easy to spot in the hive. The beekeeper watches the queen to be sure she is healthy and producing eggs. During its lifetime, a honeybee goes through complete metamorphosis. That means each stage of its development looks and behaves differently. Bees go through four stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Why are worker bees so important? A honeybee hive is a colony made up of 20,000 to 30,000 adult bees. Most of these are worker bees. However, a honeybee colony is more than just a group of bees living together. It's a family. The mother of the colony is the queen. She's the only female able to produce offspring. She produces about 2,000 eggs each day. Adding new young to the colony is her only job. Workers constantly hover around her, feeding her and carrying her waste out of the hive. The colony also has a few hundreds to a few thousand drones. These are males that are able to reproduce. Their only job is to mate with any new queen bees the hive produces. Even though they may live up to five years, honeybee queens mate only shortly after they become adults. Drones are raised during the summer. Any still in the hive in the fall are usually pushed out by the workers. The drones soon die. Thousands of worker bees make up the rest of the colony. These are females that can't produce offspring. Worker bees perform lots of very important jobs for the colony. What a worker does depends on her age. A worker's first job as an adult is house cleaning. Worker bees clear out empty cells that were used to raise young, called larvae, in the hive. Then these cells can be reused to raise more brood. By the time a worker has been an adult for about four days, she's able to digest pollen and produce a special liquid called brood food. It's fed to the larva. The young workers also produce an especially rich brood food called royal jelly. They feed it to the queen bee and take care of her for the next week of their lives. Workers also feed royal jelly to some of the larvae. These will develop into new queen bees. A young worker bee can also produce wax, so she's able to help repair wax cells and build new ones for the hive. The cells are used to store bee bread and honey as well as to rear brood. This worker is feeding larvae. Larvae need to eat and grow a lot in just five days to be ready to change into adult bees. Bees take wax flakes from other bees and chew them. Then they use their mouth parts to shape the wax into six-sided tube-like cells. These become the hive. When a worker bee is about two weeks old, she goes to the hive entrance to meet returning foragers, bees that have been collecting nectar. She connects mouth parts with a forager and receives its nectar. Then her job is to make and store honey. So she also makes and store bee bread. When she's about three weeks old, the worker leaves the hive on her first flight. She spends the rest of her life about three more weeks as a forager. During every life stage, a worker's bee job are essential to the colony survival. Without workers, the colony collapses. These worker bees are ferrying nectar and pollen to the hive. What is killing the honeybees? Could it be a change in habitat? Could honeybees be dying because something in their habitat, the place they live, changed? The sources of pollen and nectar available to honeybees have changed a lot. Farms were once a patchwork of fields growing a variety of different crops. Many modern farms have acres and acres devoted to a single crop. Bee researcher Jeff Pettis sees this as a problem for bees. When local bees only have corn available, he said, 
They have to fly as far as five miles or eight kilometers from their hive to go beyond the corn and find enough sources of nectar. That wears out their wings and shorten their lives. Pettis believes the way the bee's habitat has changed could be a reason why colonies are vanishing. Since when usually pollinate corn, corn plants don't need to attract bees. Corn plants produce no nectar. In many places, cities cover areas where there were once meadows full of wildflowers. Streets, parking lots, office buildings, shopping centers, and homes leave little room for plants. This is another way honeybees have lost some of their sources of nectar and pollen. Homes close together with small lawns aren't bee-friendly places. Could honeybees be overworked? Scientists wondered if bees could be dying from being pushed to work year-round. When honeybees live in just one place, there's often a season when little or nothing is blooming. During that period, bees don't work to collect nectar and pollen. Instead, they rest and live off their stored food. The queen also takes a break from producing eggs. However, honeybees often do not just live in one place. Farmers on big farms and orchards rent large number of bees from beekeepers to pollinate all their crops. These farmers need more bees than they could raise on their own. So beekeepers load their beehives onto trucks and move them from place to place as they are needed. That's good business for beekeepers. It also means farmers can produce lots of food for people, but it means the bees no longer have as much time to rest. Once the beehives are loaded onto the truck, they're covered. This keeps the bees inside the hives during transport. Honeybee pollination helps grow almost one third of all of our food. Dave Hackenberg and his bee colony may travel 11,000 miles or 17,700 kilometers by truck each year so the bees can pollinate important crops and make honey. Follow them on their trek. California's annual almond crop is a good example of the need for transporting bees. The almond blossom season starting in early February is the single biggest pollination event in the world. Over 1 million beehives are needed for about four weeks. Having lots of bees on hand is the only way orchard owners can make sure nearly all the flowers on their almond trees will be pollinated and their trees will produce large numbers of almonds. The resulting nut crop is about 80% of the world's almond, a three billion a year industry. Together, the almond orchards of California's Central Valley cover an area as large as the state of Rhode Island. Beekeepers earn big money by having their bees work in the almond orchards. To have their hives rented though, it's not enough for them to be available when the almond farmers need the bees. The hives must also have booming populations of worker bees. But scientist Gloria de Grande Hoffman sees problems when the bees are moved. She explains beekeepers are moving their colonies to almond orchards as early as November. Because there aren't any flowers nearby at that point, the bees are fed a diet of sugar syrup. This is cheaper than honey, and while it gives the bees the same sort of high-energy food, it's not the same. Workers raised on sugar syrup are weaker, DeGrande Hoffman says. Transporting the bees so early gives two strikes against them. They miss their natural rest, and they don't get the nutrition they need to work. Those two factors could be enough to cause colonies to collapse. A hive won't be rented unless, like this one, it has at least eight frames hanging sections covered with active worker bees. One suspect cleared. Some researchers thought wide use of cell phones was to blame for CCD. They thought all the wireless communication somehow interfered with the bees' natural ability to navigate. So workers couldn't find their way home and would fly until they die. To test this idea, cell phones and audio recorders were put inside five beehives. When the cell phones were active, playing music, the bees made the sounds they make when getting ready to swarm, which is flying away to start a new colony. But this test wasn't realistic, said scientist May Berenbaum. Cell phones wouldn't usually be that close to the bees. Also, even though the bees made those sounds, they didn't swarm. Other scientists agreed that cell phones weren't to blame for the bees' disappearance. According to the Cellular Telecommunication and Internet Association, the CTIA, as early as 2011, the number of wireless devices in use in the United States was more than the number of people living there. Imagine the number worldwide. Could mites be the killer? Varroa mites attach themselves to a bee and sucks its blood. This doesn't usually kill the bee, but it weakens the bee and shorten its life. The mite's bite often also passes on viruses, disease causing living things, to the bee. Because the bee is already weak from the mite's attack, a virus might kill it. 
Once varroa mites are in a hive, they reproduce and their numbers rapidly multiply. It's no wonder the mites spread quickly through the bee colony. The varroa mites also spread to other hives when nectar is scarce and bees from one colony come to steal honey from another hive. Varroa mites are a big problem for honeybees. However, efforts to prevent the varroa mites attacks are causing even more trouble. May Berenbaum explains, beekeepers put massive amounts of chemicals into their hives to protect the bees from varroa mites. Those chemicals can also be hard on the bees. Berenbaum believes varroa mites and the chemicals used to protect bees from them could be at least part of what's causing the CCD. The varroa mite, a cousin of a spider, has been nicknamed the vampire mite for sucking blood-like liquid from bees. Could a deadly fungus be killing honeybees? A fungus called Nosema serrani, a distant relative of bread mole, is another problem for honeybees. It spreads when an infected bee stops at puddles and ponds for a drink and drops its waste. The seed-like spores from this fungus can be left there. If a healthy bee drinks that water, it may take in some of the spores. Then the fungus begins to grow in the bee's gut. This affects the lining of the honeybee's digestive system. The cells of the lining no longer produces the juices the bee needs to digest its food, so the bee doesn't get the energy it needs to be active. And instead of leaving the hive to drop its waste, the infected bee drops some waste inside the hive. Then other bees in the hive pick up the spores and become infected too. A bee infected with Nosema serrani becomes weak. It may become too weak to make it back to the hive from a foraging trip. But scientists and beekeepers can't easily tell when the fungus is at work. Bee researcher Bob Curry says the problem is that with Nosema serrani, there aren't any obvious symptoms. This highly magnified view shows Nosema serrani spores attacking one of the host cells. The only way beekeepers or researchers can be sure that this fungus is what's causing workers to disappear is to examine some of the bees in a colony. They squash bee bodies and study them through a microscope to check for the fungi spores. Like bees attacked by varroa mites, bees with Nosema serrani often fall victim to viruses. Then it's the viruses that kill the bees. Curry believes honeybees being infected with both Nosema serrani and viruses could be a key reason colonies are collapsing. This bee didn't have any symptoms to show it was sick before it died. Could pesticides be the problem? Chemicals called pesticides are used to kill plants, animals, and fungi that attack plant leaves and fruit. However, many pesticides, especially those used to kill insect pests, are also harmful to people. So in the mid-1990s, farmers around the world switched to using newer chemicals called neonicotinoids pesticides. These were developed to mimic nicotine, a chemical found in a tobacco plant's leaves. It acts on insects' nervous system to paralyze the insect and then kill them. The new chemicals were designed to be safe for people and animals other than insects. Scientists also believe neonicotinoids were safe for bees even though they are insects. That's because bees were only exposed to small doses while collecting nectar and pollen from flowers. By 2009, though many beekeepers and scientists around the world agreed that small doses may be all that's needed to harm honeybees. Gloria de Granda Hoffman research team is studying how even small doses of chemical may affect bees. She believes exposure to pesticides might be at least partly to blame for bee death and colony losses. Helicopters spray pesticides over large areas like this almond orchard. Tiny tracking devices let researchers follow foraging bees to study them. Honeybee killer, case open. Clearly, a lot of different things could be killing honeybees. Scientist Keith Delaplane said, We're conditioned to think one problem means one cure, but we're discovering the world is more complicated than that. No one yet knows what combination of causes is killing entire colonies of honeybees. So researchers are continuing to study bees to better understand how their bodies function. Researchers are also continuing to study how bees work together as a colony. Meanwhile, beekeepers and people who simply want to help are doing what they can. The goal is to keep honeybees alive while scientists search for a way to stop CCD. This scientist is collecting bee pupa to study. Two lucky things about bees. The impact of CCD could be even worse if not for two lucky facts about bees. First, hives can be split so one hive becomes two. Second, honeybees can easily be moved and will quickly adapt to pollinating plants wherever they are living. Beekeepers have always been able to replace lost hives fairly easily, as research Jeff Pettis explained. 
If you lost one of the two dairy cows, you couldn't split the remaining cow in half and have two again. However, you can do that with the bee colony because colonies produce a number of new queen bees each year. To split a colony, half the worker bees are moved to a new hive. Next, a new queen bee that has mated and is ready to start laying eggs is introduced to that new hive. Then, over time, each new colony will raise enough young to grow into a full colony. This is a swarm of bees. Sometimes, bee colonies just naturally split to form two colonies from one. As long as they aren't overworked, bees can be moved. Then they will take over doing the same work that local bees did previously. Beekeeper Randy Oliver has seen this. Moving bees from crop to crop is like moving cows or sheep to fresh pasture, he said. Once the bees are relocated, we uncover the hives. Even before the last bees are released, the first colonies are out foraging. Released after a long trip, the bees leave to drop their waste. Honeybees don't usually drop waste inside their hives. Give bees a healthy diet. Gloria de Grandi Hoffman realized a bee's diet was also a major player in the CCD. I believe many problems that develop, even CCD, were downstream effects of poor nutrition, she said. So my team developed a special bee diet. Now beekeepers can feed their bees this high protein diet instead of sugar syrup. That keeps the worker bees strong and healthy while they're waiting for a crop such as almonds to bloom. To prove this new diet would help bees stay healthy and colonies survive, De Grande Hoffman's team set up twin flight arenas. These were screen areas where bee colonies could live but not escape. One group was given a solution of sugar syrup to feed on. Another was given the new protein-rich food. At first, both groups did well. However, bees fed on sugar syrup started foraging at a younger age and died sooner than those fed the protein-rich diet. These bees are being fed a sugar syrup diet. Using computer modeling, de Grande Hoffman's team also projected what would happen if varroa mites attack. The results were that the colony feeding on sugar syrup wouldn't be able to replace workers fast enough, so the colony would collapse. What honeybees eat clearly makes a difference. These bees are sucking up the special protein-rich drink. As news about CCD spread around the world, people everywhere became concerned that a loss of honeybees could seriously affect plant pollination. Soon people who had never before considered tending bees started taking action. To make sure there were plenty of bee colonies in their area, they set up beehives near their homes. The idea of beekeeping even caught on in big cities. These beehives have been on the roof of the Paris Opera House for nearly 20 years. Today, there are beehives on house rooftops, on apartment building balconies, on school grounds, and even on the grounds of famous landmarks. The air around city buildings is usually warmer than the surrounding area. That's good for bees in parts of the world where winters can be cold. And in every city where bees are given homes, plants benefit from having resident pollinators. People who tend honeybees get a treat too, the honey that the bees produce. A beehive was installed at the White House in 2009. With lots of gardens around it, it has produced as much as 340 pounds of honey in a year, nearly twice what hives normally produce. Raising Hygienic Bees Researcher Marla Spivak and her team helped breed a special kind of bee that's helping colonies survive. These are called hygienic bees. When something is clean enough to be healthy, it's said to be hygienic. Hygienic bees fight back when varroa mites and some diseases attack their hive. Scientists have discovered that sick pupae or pupae infested with mites give off odors. Hygienic worker bees can detect those smells with their antenna. When the workers identify a pupa with those odors, they kill it. Then they remove it from the hive, keeping the colony clean. That's why they're called hygienic. How does Spivak breed these special bees? She explained, I tracked colonies that were good honey producers and showed hygienic behavior. Then I used them to raise queens. It took about six years, but I finally developed queens that would produce hygienic colonies. Now, beekeepers can raise colonies that can defend themselves against mites and some diseases. The colonies of hygienic bees are raised close to other hygienic bee colonies. That way, any new queen will naturally mate with hygienic drones. Then the new colonies, those queens start, will carry on that special trait. The queen is inside a cage sealed with a candy plug. It will take a couple of days for worker bees to eat through this plug and release her. That's time enough for them to get used to her pheromones or chemical signals and accept her. The worker bees tear the mite-infested pupa into small pieces and carry those out of the hive. Give bees a break. 
Eric and Sue Olson, beekeepers for 35 years, decided to try giving their bees a winter break. They knew they had to do something or CCD was going to put them out of business. In 2009, they lost 55% of their 15,000 beehives. In 2010, after replacing their lost colonies, they suffered huge losses again. 75% of their hives collapsed. So in November 2011, after rebuilding their colonies yet again, they didn't transport their beehives to California as they usually did at the time of the year. Instead, they moved the hives into an apple storage warehouse. In California, the warm weather would have kept the bees flying, and the bees would have needed to be fed to make up for not being able to find enough flowers to meet their nectar needs. But in the dark warehouse, with the temperature at a constant 40 degrees Fahrenheit, the bees stopped flying, and the queen took a break from rearing brood. Safe from windstorm, cold snaps, and even predators like bears and skunk, the bees rested. The Olsons' experiment worked. When we took the bees to the almonds at the end of January 2011, Sue said, they were fat and healthy, and when the almond season finished that year, we'd only lost 3% of our hives. Stacked eight and nine hives high, the bee colonies are having a safe, pretend winter inside the warehouse. Will the future be sweet? By spring 2012, U.S. beekeepers were reporting an annual loss of only 20% of their hives from CCD. That was much better than the 30 to 50% loss reported in 2007, and scientists believe things were looking up for the bees. But by early 2013, the situation had changed. The 2013 season may be the worst yet for CCD, reported beekeeper Dave Hackenberg. So why are colonies still disappearing so quickly? The summer of 2012 was a very dry in some parts of the United States. In those areas, the bees would have produced and stored less honey than usual for times when there wasn't any nectar source. Beekeepers also reported an increase in varroa mites in their hives in 2012. Reports of Nosema serrani, though, weren't any worse. Researcher Jeff Pettis said, These ups and downs just prove that we're still trying to get a handle on this problem and that there's more work to be done. Honeybees still buzz around plants and fairy pollen between flowers but the world is becoming an unfriendly place for bees. Will honeybees ever be safe from the threat of CCD? Scientists and beekeepers are combining their efforts and continuing to work hard to make that possible. For now though, the challenge is making sure enough honeybees survive for colonies to make it from one year to the next. The idea of honeybee colonies living free of the threat of collapse is only a dream. There isn't any place in the world that's completely safe for honeybees, at least not yet. Author's note, no movie about tracking down killers could be more exciting than this true story. It was thrilling to search out and interview scientists who are working on this case. One of my favorite moments was talking to Gloria de Grande Hoffman and hearing how excited and hopeful she was about her work. She explained how new technologies are opening up new research possibilities that could help stop CCD. Then I talked to beekeepers and became caught up in the very personal side of the story of the vanishing honeybees. Like any farmer with livestock, beekeepers care about the bees they tend. They're crushed by losing so many in a bad year. The problem is, even in a good year, honeybees are still dying. Colonies both tended by beekeepers and those in the wild remain at risk of collapsing. Perhaps one day you'll become the science detective who finally makes the world safe for honeybees. That will also make it a healthier place for all of us. Honeybees are amazing. Scientists believe honeybees have been at work pollinating earth plants for over 30 million years. In fact, honey has been found in ancient Egyptian tombs. You may be amazed to learn it's still safe to eat. That's because honey contains natural preservative that prevents bacteria from growing in it. Check out some other incredible facts about honeybees. Honeybees have two stomachs. One digests food and one holds nectar while they forage. Honeybees Larvae don't give off waste, so they can grow up inside a wax cell on a puddle of food and not get it dirty. Honeybees perform special movements called dances to let other workers know how far and what directions to fly to find food. They can give directions to supplies within about 500 feet of the hive. Honeybees produce pheromones. This let worker bees guard the hive entrance. Any arriving honeybee that doesn't have the pheromone of a hive mate could be a honey thief and is attacked. Bees produce wax, and without any training or blueprint, bees build perfect six-sided tube-like cells. Bees also slightly angle the cells up so honey and pollen won't fall out. Help your local honeybees. Here are some things you can do that will make a big difference to your local honeybees. Buy local honey. That helps local beekeepers so they're able to maintain their bee colonies in your community. 
Plant with honeybees in mind. If your family plants a garden or flower pots, choose plants whose flowers will supply bees with nectar and pollen. Check with your local plant nursery to find out what's best to plant in your area. In the United States, download the free pollinator-friendly planting guide for your area. It's available from the Pollinator Partnership. Keep in mind that bees are especially attracted to blue, purple, and yellow flowers. Let weeds grow until their flowers are finished blooming. Bees benefit from having access to dandelions and clovers. Even more important is to not use pesticides on grass and weeds. Encourage your school and local community to leave areas for plants around playgrounds and parking lots. You can also suggest they choose landscaping plants, even if they're only potted plants with bees in mind.